I don't have a microphone today. If you can't hear me, please come a little close. We're going to have a little bit of crosstalk, okay? That way, uh, like, I don't know how loud it will go over there, but we're pretty scooch in. All right, so my name is Tyler Hacking. Um, I've been in the cannabis industry for 20 years. Uh, people laugh when I tell them that. Uh, I'm 34 this year, and I, I was on my first farm when I was 14. Um, I didn't really tell my mom until I was a bit older that that's what I was doing in the, in the summers, but I floated around California um, for quite a while, the Redwoods, Washington, Oregon. I was in Colorado the first four years that they legalized, so I was able to become familiarized with the legislature and a huge variety of different cultivation techniques. There's a lot of ways to grow cannabis, correctly and incorrectly. Today I'm going to use myself and clients that I work with as examples of the different kinds of skills that you can use in the cannabis industry. You might already have some of these skills and not even realize it. Okay? Uh, one of them I'm working on is making PowerPoints. <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> right. So. I'm a consultant. My job is to find problems and fix them and to help mostly startup businesses in the cannabis industry to be successful. There's a 90% turnover rate for startups. Um, I, I think that sucks and it's really just because people don't realize how complicated this industry is when they get into it. It's probably why a lot of people are here today to learn, right? So you guys have taken a really good first step, okay, just by being here. These are some of the crops that I worked on over the last year. Um, I do a lot of field analysis. You can see me with my dinky microscope. We go around and try to find pathogens of different types. We identify them um, because you get rid of different pests in different ways. and. This being a medical crop, you have to be very careful how you get rid of pests. Everything that you do needs to be not only organic, but approved by the state. Um, the state of Utah pretty much copied the uh, approved list of organic pesticides from Colorado. You can look that up online for the Department of Agriculture. Alright, so I do lots of research. I like to understand the fundamentals behind plant biogeophysiochemistry. I like to understand why soil impacts plants in different ways. I've seen this plant grown in a thousand different ways with varying degrees of success. Okay, and I became very curious what was causing that. Um, and that caused me to come back to school about five years ago. I hit a wall where I couldn't learn anymore. Um, and so I wanted to put myself around people who could teach me more about this awesome topic. In the last year, I've done some really fun culinary stuff, cooking with cannabis. I'm a chef, and I really like the topic molecular gastronomy. I think the biochemistry of food is fascinating. And Cannabis alkaloids tie directly into that. Cannabis terpenes. We can pull these alkaloids and terpenes out and attach them to food with, varying, uh, with various techniques. These are some of the recipes that I did recently for a presentation on National Grocery. Alright, so in, in cooking, and, and I'm going to go fast, guys, just so we have more time for Q&A and stuff like that. Um, in the world of cooking, we have to consider ionic covalent bonds, okay? What fats can take on how many alkaloids, right? What temperatures do they have to get to to become bioavailable to humans? Um, on this next slide, uh, maybe it's a few more. I, I, I put this up because I want to show you guys that... Um, Whatever skills that you have, you can arrange them in a way that is presentable, okay? If you're trying to get a job with an employer in this industry, you need to be presentable. There are a lot of people who are not very good at that in this industry, and if you can be presentable and present yourself with skills that appeal to your employer, you're much more likely to get hired, okay? Um, 
a lot of the people who taught me these things were, were not very presentable, you know, would it come to events like this. The industry has changed. Uh, I wear a tie every time I come to one of these events because it comes across in a, in a good way, right, in a professional way. You have to think about that. A, a lot of the people from this culture are very independent, is the word I'll use, right? But you want to come across professionally, right? I understand, I like to, you know, walk around in my pajamas all day myself. But look professional, act professional, and present yourself professionally, and it will go a long way. So, another skill I want to talk about today, a variety of skills, an entire category is laboratory analysis, okay? I got this microscope for $800, right? It's a biological compound microscope, and I can look at very, very small, invisibly small insects, and with these pictures, I took all of these last year, I can share them with entomologists, people who are skilled specifically with identifying insects. And by doing that, by, by knowing exactly what species it is, I can find the predatory insect that feeds on that. I can find the specific organic treatment to be able to remove these insects from a crop. And, and this, is, this is a skill that I taught myself. I didn't need to go to school for this. Everybody here can do this if you can get a microscope. I, I have a few that fit in my pocket that I go out um, to crops with. Yeah, look at this horrifying little monster, right? <laughs> um, in Utah, I've seen a lot of mites. We're, we're impacted by about five to seven different mites, depending on where your, your latitude is. And they will devastate a crop. Um, what I like to talk to my clients a lot about is uh, something called integrative pest management, okay? It's a combination of different techniques and methods that are used to prevent the infestation of insects and also powdery mildew. Um, I like ladybugs, they're my favorite. Um, they're great and one trick I like to teach people is that if, if you put ladybugs out right before the sun goes down and you, get, you can get a special misting attachment for your hose from Home Depot or a lot of garden stores. If you spray them with mist, not water droplets, it's what we heard them. <laughs> but if you mist them right as the sun goes down, instinctually they'll go, oh shoot, I can't fly, I'm wet and cold, and they'll burrow. They'll actually make a temporary little nest in your garden and have eggs that continue to eat your pests after they fly away. Okay? After they eat all the food, they'll leave, but they don't always get all the food. So this is something that I really like to talk to customers about because once you've had significant damage to your plant's vascular system, it's, it's over. Um, these pests also carry pathogens, they carry bacteria and fungi, and when they bite the plant, it's, it's on their mouth and it goes into the plant and infects the plant. So preventing them from ever getting there is definitely ideal, but you can't use chemical pesticides on this one. So, one of the things that got me into this industry was just how impactful this plant is. It, it helped me a lot, personally. It, it saved my life. It gave me my life back. And I've seen it transform other people's lives in the most amazing ways. And, um, I, I have social anxiety disorder. It's really difficult for me to actually come speak in front of people. And because of of my medical cannabis use. I've been able to get myself out there and go to conventions and um, speak at Silicon Suds and things like that. I ended up on Fox News somehow without realizing it. <laughs> so I'm just saying that um, if you're going to take anything away from my presentation today, please know that money is not going to come to you. You have to go to money. You have to put yourself out there. You have to try to meet with people that are involved in this industry and they're very generous and enabling, I found. Especially in Utah, people are so supportive. Um, there's very, very few, you know, negative Nancys out there. There's a lot of people here today who can, who are just here to enable other people in this industry because they want to see it grow. And all that you have to do is try to make the connections so that you can do that. So make sure you you have fun too. Um, we like to have and fight sometimes. And, but also make sure you take care of your plants. <laughs> Those are just, I had to share some funny things. This is from one of our um, most recent clients. 
cultivation. This is a, a first season cultivator, guys. Okay? And when they got into this, they, they did not know how to grow this plant. They went out of their way to find the skills necessary to be able to do this. And this is the result. This is um, the best CBD smokable flower that I've seen in Utah this last year. I'm extremely impressed. They did so well that, that two of their varieties went hot and they had to destroy it because it went over the legal limit, unfortunately. But this is an example of what you can do if you go out of your way to utilize the skill sets and the expertise, the experience of, of experts, right, professionals in this industry. And, and it's really easy to tell when you're talking to somebody if they know what they're talking about. Um, they'll use very specific terms and they'll. One, one thing I like to do to filter people out is um, if they're talking more about your money than your crop production, then that's what, that's what they're interested in, right? Um, when you approach an employer, you need to give the appearance that you're interested in their goals and their objectives. Every employer I've ever met in the cannabis industry has different goals and different obstacles, different properties, different problems and um, different aspirations in general. So keep that in mind, and try to think about how you can fit into what they're doing. Like, what skills do you have now that can actually benefit them, okay? This is another property we worked on in Moroni. Um, super fast, inside of a turkey barn, lots of fun. All right, so what cultivators want are it's pretty much lots of biomass, right? That's their bottom line. They don't just want lots of biomass, but they want it to be the right composition for them to be able to market it. I know a lot of people are sitting on a lot of weight right now. They grew a lot of cannabis, but they can't get rid of it because it got too much water, too little light, too little nutrients, and it didn't develop the way that it needed to to be a liquidatable product. Okay? Uh, if you're good at marketing, you have a place in this industry. There are a lot of cultivators, business owners that don't want to deal with that, that don't want to deal with um, online social networking, that don't want to deal with their website development. I'm one of them. If anybody makes websites, let me know. I totally don't want to deal with that at all. Um, but the, what most cultivators want is, is to produce, to grow. They, they love growing. It's enjoyable to them. You know? um, that being said, these are not hemp plants. They're not ever going to get this big. Just an example. So, this is uh, pretty much the only wording I'm going to use in this. I wanted to use a lot of pictures so that I could give visual examples. Um, this is a crop in southern Utah. These are the goals of a lot of, of business owners, like I was saying, um, you know, website development, client acquisition. A lot of business owners don't want to deal with their own sales. They want to deal with operating their business and developing products. So if you have sales experience, if you have customer service experience, those are all jobs that are applicable in the cannabis industry. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is a, a particular one, finding a location of operation. That's one of the bi bi biggest obstacles for startup cannabis businesses, is finding a place to actually start your business. Okay. Um, so a lot of that other stuff we talked about. I'm going to skip ahead for time. So one of, the, one of the biggest problems that I see in cross is nutrient deficiencies. And that can be a very complicated topic because many of these deficiencies, as you see, their characteristics can overlap. They can look almost identical. Okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit since we're short on time. I just wanted to show lots of different examples. This is the ideal uh, pH range for cultivation. Knowledge of things like this can be very valuable. Lots of people are trying to do hydroponics, aquaponics, things like that, and being able to balance the new, the, uh, the pH solution concentration is essential to make sure that all of the micronutrients and macronutrients are available to the plant so it develops properly. A lot of this information you can find for free online. You can start teaching yourself about these topics with YouTube videos. I've learned a lot of stuff from them. Just learn to filter through some patent ones. That's probably the biggest trick I'd recommend. Um, there's a lot of people in this industry that 
are very sure of things that have not been verified. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, I was going to do a little guess the pest game, but we'll just get past the same. This is uh, broad mites, spider mites, and russet mites, and these are aphids. And like I said before, uh, insects in general, not just aphids, are vectors for disease. Okay, so if you get one insect in your indoor cultivation, the entire thing can get powdery milky. Yeah, go on. Um, a lot of this information is available online. You can find it very easily. I like to use predatory insects because it's an organic treatment. And they go away when they need the, the pests, so they're not even in your plant material when you're done. Um, there's different predators for different pests. I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go quick. So I'm going to go quick. Love you, um, learning to identify different stressors on the plant, uh, disease, is really good, okay, because you need to remove diseased plants that are infectious to other plants. This is an example of the back in the mosaic virus. This is heat stress, right? So coupling is heat stress? Most of the time, almost always. It can, it can be a nutrient deficiency, but typically when you see lots of leaves like that, you've got too much. And the yellow is? Yellow can vary a lot. This right here is a mutation. Um, it's called variegation. So it is a problem with the chloroplast developing. So in this entire leaf, the chloroplast, the photosynthetic part of the plant cell, doesn't develop. And so it's a, it's a mutation in the DNA. This is called polypoidy. And polypoidy, uh, this is also polypoidy. <coughs> And it's also called fasciation. It has a full set of male and female DNA. And they look really weird. They get this crown at the end. Are we done? Okay. Do we have time for Q&A? Uh, we're cycling through. You'll have time. Okay. We're going to be doing it full loop again. So. I'll, I'll be doing so, another yeah, one, so guys. This is class one. We're cycling Kaylee. If you guys want to cycle okay. through some of the other ones, it'll definitely be available. All the time. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we'll start on.